so the next video I'm going to start a classic book, The Borrowers by Mary Norton. <clears throat> it starts with chapter one. It was Mrs. May who first told me about them. No, not me. How could it have been me? A wild, untidy, self-willed little girl who stared with angry eyes and was said to crunch her teeth. Kate, she should have been called. Yes, that was it. Kate. Not that the name matters much either way. She barely comes into the story. Mrs. May lived in two rooms in Kate's parents' house in London, and she was, I think, some kind of relation. Her bedroom was on the first floor, and her sitting room was a room which, as part of the house, was called a breakfast room. Now, breakfast rooms are all right in the morning when the sun streams in on the toast calmly, but by the afternoon they seem to vanish a little and to fill with a strange silvery light, their own twilight. There is a kind of sadness in them then, but as a child it was the sadness Kate liked. She would creep into Mrs. May just before tea time, and Mrs. May would teach her to crochet. Mrs. May was old. Her joints were stiff, and she was not strict exactly, but she had that inner certainty which does, in the, in, does instead. Kate was never wild with Mrs. May, nor untidy, nor self-willed, and Mrs. May taught her many things beside crochet. How to wind wool into an egg-shaped ball, how to run and fell and plan a dun, a darn, how to tidy a drawer and to lay like a blessing above the contents a sheet of rustling tissue against the dust. Why so quiet, child? asked Mrs. May one day when Kate was sitting hunched and idle upon the ha hassock. What's the matter with you? Have you lost your tongue? No, said Kate, pulling out a shoe button. I've lost a crochet hook. They were making a bed quilt in woolen squares. There were thirty still to do. I know where I put it, she went on hastily. I put it on the bottom shelf of the bookcase just beside my bed. On the bottom shelf, repeated Mrs. May, her own needle flicking steadily in the firelight. Near the floor? Yes, said Kate, but I looked on the floor, under the rug, everywhere. The wool was still there, though, just where I left it. Oh dear, exclaimed Mrs. May lightly. Don't say they're in this house, too. That what I asked Kate. The borrowers, said Mrs. May, and in the half-light she seemed to smile. Kate stared a little fearfully. Are there such things, she asked after a moment. As what? Kate blinked her eyelids. As people, other people living in a house, who borrow things. Mrs. May laid down her work. What do you think, she asked. I don't know, said Kate, looking away and pulling hard at her shoe button. There can't be, and yet... She raised her head, and yet sometimes I think there must be. Why do you think that there must be? asked Mrs. May. Because of all the things that disappear. Safety pins, for instance. Factories go on making safety pins, and everyday people go on buying safety pins, and yet somehow there is never a safety pin just when you want one. Where are they all? Now at this minute, where do they go to? Take needles, she went on. All the needles my mother ever bought, there must be hundreds. Can't just be lying around the house. Not lying about the house, no, agreed Mrs. May. And all the other things we keep on buying, again and again and again, like pencils and matchboxes and sealing wax and hair slides and drawing pins and thimbles and hat pins, put in Mrs. May, and blotting paper. Yes, blotting paper, agreed Kate. But not hat pins. That's where you're wrong, said Mrs. May, and she picked up her work again. There, there was a reason for hat pins. Kate stared. A reason? She repeated, I mean, what kind of reason? Well, there was two reasons, really. A hat pin is a very useful weapon, and Mrs. May laughed suddenly. But it all sounds such nonsense, and she hesitated, and it was so very long ago. But tell me, said Kate, tell me how you know about the hat pin. Did you ever see one? Mrs. May threw her a subtle glance. Well, yes, she began. Not a hat pin, exclaimed Kate impatiently. A whatever you call them, a borrower? Mrs. May drew a sharp breath. No, she said quickly, I never saw one. But someone else saw one cried Kate, and you know about it, I can see you do. Hush, said Mrs. May, no need to shout. She gazed downward at the upturned face, and then she smiled, and her eyes slid away into the distance. I had a brother, she began uncertainly. Kate knelt upon the hassock, and he saw them. I don't know, said Mrs. May, shaking her head, I just don't know. She smoothed out her work upon her knee. He was such a tease, he told her so many things, my sister and me, impossible things, he was killed, she added gently, many years ago now on the northwest frontier. He'd become colonial of his regiment. 
He died what they call a hero's death. Was he your only brother? Yes, and he was our little brother. I think that was why she thought for a moment, still smiling to herself. Yes, why he told us such impossible stories, such strange imaginings. He was jealous, I think, because we were older and because we could read better. He wanted to impress us. He wanted, perhaps, to shock us. And yet, she looked into the fire. There was something about him. Perhaps because we were brought up in India among mystery and magic and legend. Something that made us think that he saw things that other people could not see. Sometimes we didn't know he was teasing, but other times, well, we were not so sure. She leaned forward, and in her tidy way brushed a fan of loose ashes under the grate, then, brush in hand, she stared it again at the fire. He wasn't a very strong little boy. The first time he came home from India, he got rheumatic fever. He missed a whole term at school, and then and was sent away to the country to get over it. To the house of a great aunt. Later I went there myself. It was a strange old house. She hung up the brush on its brass hook, and dusting her hands on a handkerchief, she picked up her work. Better light the lamp, she said. Not yet, begged Kate, leaning forward. Please go on. Please tell me. But I've told you. No, you haven't. This old house. Wasn't that where he saw... He saw Mrs. Layla, Mrs. May laughed. Where he saw the borrowers? Yes, that's what he told us. What he'd have us believe. And what's more, it seems he didn't just see them, but that he got to know them very well. That he became part of their lives, as it were. In fact, you might always almost say he, that he became a borrower himself. Oh, do tell me, please. Try to remember, right from the very beginning. But I do remember, said Mrs. May. Oddly enough, I remember it better than many real things which have happened. Perhaps it was a real thing. I just don't know. You see, on the way back to India, my brother and I had to share a cabin. My sister used to sleep with our governess, and on those very hot nights, often we couldn't sleep, and my brother would talk for hours and hours, going over old ground, repeating conversations, telling me details again and again, wondering how they were and what they were doing, and they, who were they exactly? Homily, Pod, and little Arietti. Pod? Yes, even their names were never quite right. They imagined they had their own names, quite different from human names, but with half an ear you could tell they were borrowed. Even Uncle Hendrys and Eglatinas. Everything they had was borrowed. They had nothing of their own at all. Nothing. In spite of this, my brother said they were touchy and conceited, and thought they owned the world. How do you mean? They thought human beings were just invented to do the dirty work. Great slaves put there for them to use. At least that's what they told each other. But my brother said that underneath he thought they were frightened. It was because they were frightened he thought that they had grown so small. Each generation had become smaller and smaller and more and more hidden. In the old days, it seemed, and in some parts of England, our ancestors quite openly talked about the little people. Yes, said Kate, I know. Nowadays, I suppose, Mrs. May went on slowly. If they exist at all, you would only find them in houses which are old and quiet and deep in the country. And where human beings live to a routine. Routine is their safeguard. It is important for them to know which rooms would be used and known. They do not stay long where there are careless people, unruly children, or certain household pets. This particular house, of course, was ideal, although as far as some of them were concerned, a trifle cold and empty. Great Aunt Sophie was bedridden through a hunting accident some twenty years before. And as for other human beings, there was only Mrs. Driver, the cook. Cramp fell the gardener, and it rare intervals the odd, an odd housemaid or such. My brother, too, when he went there after rheumatic fever, had to spend long hours in bed, and for those first weeks it seemed the borrowers did not know of his existence. He slept in the old night nursery beyond the night, beyond the schoolroom. The schoolroom at the time was sheeted and shrouded and filled with junk. Odd trunks, a broken sewing machine, a desk, a dressmaker's dummy, a table, some chairs, and a disused pianola, as the children who had used it. Great Aunt Sophie's children had long since grown up, married, died, or gone away. The night nursery opened out of the schoolroom, and from his bed my brother could see the oil painting of the Battle of Waterloo which hung above the schoolroom fireplace, and on the wall a corner cupboard with glass doors in which was set out on hooks and shelves a doll's tea service, very delicate and old. At night, if the schoolroom doors opened, he had a view down a lighted passage which led to the staircase, and that would comfort him to see each evening at dusk Mrs. Driver appear at the head of the stairs and cross the package ca passage carrying her tray for Aunt Sophie with bath, oliver biscuits and a tall cut glass of can of fine old pale Madeira. On her way out, Mrs. Driver would pause and lower the gas jet in the passage to a dim blue flame. 
and then he would watch her as she stumped away downstairs, sinking slowly out of out of sight between the banisters. Under this passage in the hall below, there was a clock, and through the night he would hear it strike the hours. It was a grandfather clock, and very old. Mr. Frith of Light and Buzzard came each month to wind it, as his father had come before him, and his great-uncle before that. For eighty years they had, and to Mr. Frith's certain knowledge it had not stopped, and as far as anyone could tell, for as many years before that. The great thing was, that it must never be moved. It stood against the wainscot and the stone flags around it had been washed so often that a little platform, a brother said, rose up inside, and under this clock below the wainscot there was a hole, and that ends the first chapter. So, I hope you'll enjoy this one also.